First off, hello, everybody. Hope you're having an awesome Wednesday. It's another edition of Wealth Wednesday here. I'm Tony Hellenbrand from Safeguard Wealth Management. You know, whether you're watching us out there in our Facebook group in Retirement Mastery or through our YouTube channel, Safeguard Wealth Management on YouTube, love to have you guys here every Wednesday. And, and we're really looking forward to getting a lot more going through the end of the year here, especially around tax planning. So, so you're going to be seeing these, these Wealth Wednesdays coming through uh, with a lot of very tax heavy concepts here coming into year end. And um, Today's going to be an interesting one. So this will be one that if you've never gotten really into the weeds in terms of like charitable gifting, it's probably going to be a lot of new concepts and ideas, but I think that they're applicable to a lot more people than most people think. A lot of people see some of these charitable remainder trust ideas, you know, whether it's crats or cruts or whatever it may be. And they kind of go, oh, that's for like the uber rich multi-billionaire type of person. And it's not really the case. They're, they're, they're a lot more flexible and, and they're a lot more useful to, to a lot more people than a lot of people think. So let's dive into it and get going here. So first off in concept, what is a charitable remainder trust? They're really simple. We're going to go through some drawings here in a minute, but um, in concept, the donor, so the person with the money, you know, the, the donor, the grantor makes a gift Okay, it's usually dollars or securities, you know, but they, they make a gift to an irrevocable trust. Okay, that means they, they can't undo it. They can't take the money out later. The donor in the process of doing that, they get a deduction because they are making a gift and that, that irrevocable trust, as we'll see in just a minute, has already named a charity, a, a nonprofit charitable organization is, the, is the, going to be the ultimate recipient of that gift. So the donor gets a deduction right now, and the assets also leave their estate. So right now, a lot of people don't have, you know, monstrous estate planning concerns just due to the size of the exemptions being, you know, close to $12 million, getting way up there in, in terms of net worth. There's just not a lot of people that are breaching those levels, but there's a lot of talk out there about reducing those levels and going back, you know, as recently as the, the nineties and stuff, we are seeing those, those estate exemptions being more like half a million to a million dollars. So I think in the future in coming years, these charitable remainder trust ideas are going to, are going to move more and more to kind of center stage for some of the, the people that have, you know, maybe accumulated one to $2 million in a 401k, or they also maybe have some company stock and a brokerage account that's appreciated real well. And, you know, maybe for whatever reason, between pensions and different things, their income's in a pretty good situation. And they're, they're kind of looking for tax planning ideas to help reduce the size of their estate. But, um, but anyway, the assets do leave your estate, the trust. So that, that, that bucket that you put the, the, you know, you put that money in this trust right here, that bucket, that trust then pays the, the donor income as, as, you know, as long as they're alive. So you can set up the terms, you can adjust this, but let's just say for most people, the way they do it is this is going to be for life. It's going to pay me income as long as I'm alive. And then when I pass away, whatever chunk is in that, um, charitable trust, that remaining dollar value is going to go on to my charity. Okay. So that's kind of just how they work in concept in terms of a drawing here. Again, you have you, you give money to an irrevocable trust. The trust gives you income. So, you know, generally it's annually, generally it's paid annually. If you, you can do more frequently, you can do monthly, you can do quarterly. It's just the deduction calculations get far more complicated if you do that. And there's a lot of like interpolation stuff going on of like how you're estimating payment sizes and, and taxable amounts and all that type of thing. Most people, when they do these, they do an annual payment coming out of the trust, coming back to the, to the donor, but uh, they also get a big tax deduction in year one. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. First question that we usually get in terms of charitable remainder trusts is how that distribution is ultimately taxed. And it's really a tier system. So I kind of equate this to like, you know, with Roths, there there's different tiers. When you take money out of a Roth IRA, you know, it's treated as, as uh, you know, contributions and then it's, you know, conversion number one, and then it's conversion number two until, until you get um, all the way into the growth piece of it with trusts, it's a little bit different. So with the, with these charitable remainder trusts specifically, they're regulated by a section of tax code called section 664 subsection B. So if you want to learn more about these, I suggest you, you know, go Google that on your own. And, and by the way, on all this stuff, as we're going to get into in a couple of slides, 
I don't know your situation. This is not personal advice to you. This is intended to be just really educational about, about charitable remainder trust, just to kind of get the wheels turning and maybe, you know, drive some more questions with your advisors and CPAs and estate planners and things like that. So anyway, that money that's coming out of the trust. So if we go, go back up here, that income that's coming out of the trust and coming to you, how is that income taxed? First, any income this year, so any like dividends or bond interest or any of that stuff, that's going to be treated as coming out first. Then if you had any income from like last year, let's say, let's say you're, you're distributing 5% out of this trust. And for whatever reason, you had 6% worth of dividends last year and only distributed 5%. Any of those undistributed past dividends are also going to be included as like the first tier. So it's basically dividends and bond interest. Number one, any of that money coming back out to you is taxed as ordinary income. Okay. Number two, capital gains to the extent of accumulated capital gains. So what's kind of unique about these charitable remainder trusts is they distribute short-term capital gains first. So you want to be aware of that. Any capital gains that you have that are short-term, they're going to be distributed the next time you take a distribution. So keep that in mind. And then number three, any tax exempt income you have, you know, municipal interest, that type of thing, you know, and that is tax exempt. But then number four, return of principal, which is, which is also tax exempt. So um, really the key here is that is that number one is kind of the key one. This year's income plus, plus any past undistributed income is going to be taxed as ordinary income. So um, the key thing with these remainder trusts are that any amount that's in there when you pass away. So let's say, let's say you put a million dollars in there and through time you've drawn out $500,000 worth of, you know, the principal value, you pass away and there's $500,000 left in there. That remaining amount is irrevocably gifted to charity. So that means it's going to charity. You can adjust which charity it goes to. We'll talk about that in a second. You want to be really, 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 really careful if you do that. But uh, you want that that amount is going to be going to a charity or charities. You could name multiple charities and things like that. But you want to make sure that it's it's uh, going to a nonprofit organization. So we'll, we'll kind of show you some of the deduction limits and different things like that. But in concept, just to summarize, you give money to the trust. It pays you income every year for the rest of your life generally, and you get a tax deduction up front. And then when you pass away, any remaining amount goes to charities of your choosing. So how does that deduction work? Because this is kind of a big reason that people do charitable remainder trusts. The way that the deduction works is the cash value of the gift minus the present value of the expected income stream to the donor. So what they look at it as, there's some tables that get used and some life expectancy calculations and you know certain interest rate calculations. And they kind of make an assessment of like, let's say you're giving half a million dollars. We think you're going to distribute out $300,000 over the course of your life. You would get a deduction of $200,000. And there's some limits on that deduction that we'll talk about in a second. But that's this is the, the, the sim most simplified way we can make the deduction is cash value minus the present value of the income you're going to get back out. That is your deduction. And, uh, you know, it could be affected by who the beneficiary is. So we'll, we'll kind of talk more about that in, in just a quick second. First off, when it comes into calculating the exact dollar amount of the deduction, this is the single most complicated aspect of charitable trusts. So what I really strongly recommend you do, if you're in a situation where you're evaluating a charitable remainder trust of any type, whether it's a charitable, you know, whether it's a crap crut, you know, which is basically a charitable remainder annuity trust, charitable remainder unit trust, we'll go through the different types in a second, but any of those types of things, do not try to do it yourself. Okay. Not only work with your advisor and your CPA, I would absolutely include any estate planner or attorney that, that you have working with you. And ultimately the charity itself, you'll be amazed the type of legal resources and financial planning resources that a lot of large charities have, you know, they'll, they'll have whole divisions inside of, you know, the university that are experts at like charitable gifting that in a lot of cases can really help you through a lot of the paperwork side of this. So like out of the four bullets here, I mean, as much as I'd like to, you know, uh, cheer for the advisor in this type of situation, really in my experience, it's a lot of times the charities themselves that are able to give you the most resources to help you get this gift done and get it all done properly. Because just think about it, who here has the biggest incentive to figure out charitable remainder trust, well, the charities themselves. So, so that's why the charities can can often have a very huge impact on this. So, I talked about how it can be a little bit limited. 
Let's talk about the deduction limit on charitable remainder trust. So if it's a public charity, meaning it's a 501c3, it is a public nonprofit, you can deduct up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. Unless, so there's a little asterisk here, unless it's capital gain property. So let's say it's company stock that you've had for years and years, and it's appreciated a whole big giant amount, then you can only deduct a maximum of 30% of your adjusted gross income. For a lot of people, this is still a, a pretty good deal, especially because as you know, if you've been watching any of our stuff on conversions, you know that sometimes we might recommend taking your AGI pretty high. That's going to increase the amount of charitable deduction space you have uh, if you're using something like a charitable remainder trust. So this all works together. It can, it can get quite complicated, but some of these moves, something like a conversion, a big conversion can actually allow you to get bigger charitable deductions too, because you have much more room inside these limits. So uh, in effect, what it does is it lowers your overall effective tax rate over the course of your entire life. So if the donor, this is a big one, I mentioned before, you can change the beneficiary, you can change the charity that ultimately gets those remainder dollars. But if the donor has the power to change the beneficiary, a 30% limit of AGI. So basically, if I set this up, and three years in, I go, I don't want this money to go to uh, my college anymore, I want it to go to the Humane Society. If I do that, it could mean that I'm in some tax issues now because I took a big deduction and now I've now taken a larger deduction than, than what I should have been allowed to do. So there, you know, you can go in and amend things and different things, but in general, there's going to be some, some issues that pop up. If you change the beneficiary, we always recommend you use an independent trustee on this stuff. So we'll, we'll talk more about that towards the end of, uh, end of the presentation here, but, um, for contributions, to a charitable, so I'm on the third one there, for contributions to a charitable remainder trust of capital gain property uh, to a charity not qualifying, and, and this was uh, this was a typo, used to be six, used to be 50%, now it's 60%. So let me adjust that real quick. Sorry about that. But um, if you are donating stock capital gain property, so just think about it as appreciated stock to a charitable remainder trust, and the charity is not qualified, so they're not like a 501c3, they're not a public charity, then you only have a 20% uh, AGI limit. Okay, so it's in general, just to be blunt, and you can look this up on your, on your own section. Uh, so this is tax code section 170, you know, B1D right there on the lower left corner of the screen. But you want this to be a public charity for you to be able to get the biggest tax impact out of it. And I'll just say in our experience, it's been a lion's share of charitable remainder trusts that we've seen have been going to public charities. They're going to things like universities, they're going to churches, they're going to, you know, children's hospitals, they're, you know, different things like that. So um, this usually doesn't come up, but just a good thing to know that you're not going to get the most bang for your buck if it's not a, a you know, public, legit 501c3. So let's talk about two major different types of charitable remainder trust. Uh, and the, the second one's a lot more popular than this one. And we'll talk about why in a second. But a CRAT is, stands for Charitable Remainder Annuity Trust. So the A stands for Annuity Trust. And it's a fixed dollar amount. And it's no less than 5% of the initial trust value. So you put in a million bucks. The... CRAT pays you a minimum of $50,000 a year for the rest of your life. Here's the catch. You can't add to them because it's a fixed dollar amount. You are just getting that fixed dollar amount, no matter what. Also, if the market takes a big dive, so let's say your million dollars go is hundred percent invested in stocks, crashes 50% and there's now 500 grand in there, you are still pulling out 50 grand a year. And there's actually levels of remainder amount that if you violate those levels, it can create more tax issues. So, so basically in general, CRAT is kind of viewed as uh, a little bit riskier of an option and an option that just in our experience, the vast majority of people don't take. Most people that do charitable remainder trust that we've worked with use CRUTs, and that stands for Charitable Remainder Unit Trust. The way these work is rather than a fixed dollar amount, they give you a fixed percentage of the annual trust value. So let's say your trust is trucking along at, at uh, you know, a million bucks, and it's paying you out 5%, 50 grand a year. If there's a really good year in the market where your million turns into 1.2 million, they're now going to pay you 70 grand a year out of that trust. And vice versa, if the market does really poorly, and your million turns into you know, uh, 
500,000, they're now only going to pay you $25,000 off. So this is a fixed percentage. Again, must be 5% of the annual trust value. Now, this next one is not used frequently. I just think it's a really interesting one to think about that even the people that we've worked with that have gone and worked with a charity, a lot of times the charities want to do, um, you know, cruts. They, they think that this is a, a very good overall value for the person making the gift, um, which I think it is too. It's very flexible. You can add to it. The bigger that trust gets, the bigger your distribution is going to get, you know, there's a, it, it has kind of a built-in inflation hedge that way. So a lot of people really like these crut trusts. However, there's a little bit of a twist on this where you can do something called a NIMCRUT. And I know we're getting into a little bit of the like alphabet soup of charitable planning here, but a NIMCRUT is something that I just throw it out there because I just think it's really interesting to think about, especially when we get into a phase matched NIMCRUT in just a second. But uh, NIMCRUT stands for net income with makeup charitable remainder unit trust. And a NIMCRUT distributes the lesser of the unit trust amount, which is 5%, or the trust net income. So here's where that gets really interesting. What you can do is phase matching. And when I say phase matching, I mean, maybe, maybe you're 50 and you're not going to retire for five or 10 years. You could do one of these gifts, move a big chunk of money out of your estate today, really help yourself down the road in terms of estate planning, and you could invest in a low income, high growth investment. So a lot of people go, oh boy, that sounds risky. That's a lot of like tech and stuff like that. Well, Berkshire Hathaway is a low income, you know, they don't pay a dividend, pretty high growth, you know, at least in terms of the past. We don't, again, past performance, no guarantee of future results, all that kind of fun stuff. You guys have heard that a million times. I just got to make sure that, that we get it out there so we don't get booted off YouTube. But uh, if you do one of these phase match NIMCRUTs, you can invest in low income, high growth investments while you're in accumulation. And they'll only have to pay out, like literally if you're in something paying a 1% dividend, that million dollar trust only has to pay you out 10 grand a year. As that grows, it's going to grow tax-free and outside of your estate, okay? You're getting that growth. And then later on, you can do higher payouts. So remember when I said NIMCRUT stands for net income with makeup? That makeup situation is, is a makeup account where they basically track, you should have been distributing 5% a year. You've only been distributing 1% a year. So now you have to distribute much, much more once you start taking these bigger distributions. And that's kind of perfect for something like retirement, right? You defer your big payments for the future. And then when you're no longer earning income and you're starting to make, uh, starting to take withdrawals rather, you can take larger withdrawals than what was pre-set up or what would have been available in a CRUT. So this, again, you shift to some higher income investments, Plus you can use up all of the makeup account and you can go well past that 5%, you know, whatever you originally set it as you can, you can go past that amount until that makeup account is used up the growth in the initial phase of this kind of the first, you know, the first 10 years here on this graph, that growth piece will generally be so much higher growth that it tends to leave a lot more for the charity at the end. And it also um, really, really helps you from an estate planning perspective. Because again, all of this money is outside of your estate, which is really, really critical. So we're going to go through a real quick example here, just to kind of illustrate some of the power of something like a CRUT. This is not one of the crazy NIMCRUT examples. It's just real simple CRUT, uh, charitable remainder unit trust with appreciated assets. So here we have Bill and Nancy, and uh, their goal is to give money to their university. And they have an adjusted gross income of $150,000. So again, that's, you know, their traditional IRA withdrawals. That's uh, the taxable portion of their social security, a small pension, you know, all of those things that make up their adjusted gross income that totals up to 150 grand. They have the ability using appreciated stock to receive up to $45,000 worth of deduction. Okay. So that right away is pretty interesting. That's a $45,000 reduction of your income. And you're taking stock that had a big capital gain in it and shifting it off your balance sheet. So you don't have to worry about the capital gains aspects of that stock sale down the road in the future. Okay. Had it been a cash gift. So if this was not appreciated stock, the maximum deduction is up to 60% of adjusted gross income. So that would be a $90,000 deduction potential. If the deduction amount for the amount that they want to give to the charity, let's say the, the actuaries run the numbers and they say, hey, 
you actually could, you know, due to the amount you've gifted here, you could have $100,000 in deductions. And they're looking at it going, oh man, I can't actually, because um, this is appreciated stock and I, I have $150,000 of gross income. So I'm actually limited to only 45,000. Well, they could actually do a bigger conversion and get a bigger deduction because they do that larger conversion. Okay, and again, if you're not sure if conversions make sense for you, highly recommend you check out some of the other videos we have on YouTube about partial Roth conversions. Uh, I think the best place to start is a video called Roth Conversions 101. It talks all about why Roth conversions are good, how valuable they can be. So go back and check out some of those videos. But um, using these strategies together is where you really start to see some awesome synergies. So anyway, let's just say they do this, they do this $45,000 deduction. They have some options here, right? They could just keep the deduction, bring their gross in, or sorry, bring their taxable income way down. They could pay a lot less in taxes, or they could maybe look at harvesting capital gains. I mean, in this situation, we we didn't, you know, have it be like let let's say they had, uh, let's say they only had a hundred thousand of income and they take a forty thousand dollar deduction. Well, now they're in a situation where they could actually harvest some capital gains tax free. And again, if you haven't if you haven't been looking at like loss harvesting or gains harvesting, I recommend you go back and look at some of the tax loss harvesting and tax gain harvesting. I think we have um I think we have a video called harvesting taxable accounts. That's that's a really good one that goes through a lot of the different tax strategies there. Or the other way to look at this is they could just do way more Roth conversions. So it could actually be a situation where you do more Roth conversions to open up a bigger charitable deduction and then because of the size of the deduction, you feel Feel much more comfortable going much higher on the partial Roth conversions. So again, I didn't want to get into so specific that we were losing everybody with like the specific numbers here. But remember, the key thing with these charitable remainder trusts is they're still retaining income. If they do a NIMCRUT, they have a lot more flexibility with that income when just with a CRUT. They're donating a million dollars today, let's say, but they're still going to be getting $50,000 a year plus any potential growth in terms of income. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You get the income now, you get the asset off your balance sheet, out of your estate, you get uh, the tax deduction now, which maybe opens up more room for Roth conversions, which by the way, after big Roth conversions, you, you now have a larger tax-free bucket with which you could either gift or, you know, get, pull the money out and just straight give cash. There's just a lot of ways when you start sm combining these strategies together that, that they can work together to really leave you in a, in a much, much better situation. So a couple of quick closing notes here. I mentioned, Hey, going way back to the beginning of this, you know, if we go way back up here, what if, what if, you know, five years into this, I want to change my beneficiary. Is that something I can do? And the answer is yes. But remember, if we go, if we go here, that second bullet, if the donor has the power to change the beneficiary, 30% limit of AGI in terms of your deduction. If we skip ahead here and go back to changing distributions, we recommend as fiduciaries, it is best to give an independent trustee this power for two reasons. So number one, if you make this gift, and then decide to change your mind later, not only could it potentially reduce the size of the deduction benefit that you're getting, but it could also ultimately mean that the amount of that charitable gift is pushed back into your estate for estate tax planning purposes. So ultimately it could be very, very nasty. And, and what we recommend is have an independent trustee you know, whether it's uh, uh, somebody like some sort of some of these fiduciary trust companies that are out there that will, you know, act as a trustee for a fee, uh, you know, Schwab Charitable has some abilities on this front, Fidelity, uh, I think it's Fidelity Charitable Advisor, you know, there, there's a lot of different people out there that can that can advise on this type of stuff. But the big thing is that you want to have that independent trustee be a, be the one that can change the beneficiaries, because if they if they make it you, not only, again, could you take the hit on that deduction, but ultimately it could end up being included in your estate. There's another workaround for this where you can use donor advised funds and, and basically change the beneficiary on the you know, donor advised funds side of the, of the ledger and, and take care of this. I don't, I don't want to get into the specifics here. This will turn into like a three hour wealth Wednesday, but just in general, know that with charitable remainder trusts, if your goal here is to pass money to your kids, a charitable remainder trust is not a good idea. Whether it's a crap, crut, whatever, 
all of these are, are designed and useful for situations where you're trying to give money to charity. And when you pass away, you're good with the chunk that's in that trust going to charity. Um, there is something, I, I put this CLT with a question mark. This is just a reminder for me that there are charitable lead trusts. I'm not going to do a presentation on those right now. They're, they're far less common, but a charitable lead trust works in a way where you don't really need the income and you put the money in the trust and the charity gets the income from that trust. And then when you pass away, you know, your children or grandchildren or, you know, whoever you name are the ones that inherit. So the charitable remainder, the CR, that means the charity is getting the money at the end. The CL, charitable lead, that means the charity is getting the money at the beginning, if that makes sense. Um, the deduction calculation on, on whether it's crack, crack, whatever, the, cal the calculation for that deduction is very complex. Uh, a lot of times the charities themselves are going out to third-party contractors with, you know, actuaries and stuff like that, C you know, CPAs and, and even tax attorneys to, to help them make that calculation. So uh, that will require expert advice. And also a final note on these, due to administrative costs, charitable remainder trusts, they're not a great fit for small gifts. So if you're just trying to give like $10,000 or something like that, it's not going to make sense to go through setting up trusts, making calculations, like hiring experts to make these deduction calculations and, and everything else. So um, there's not a real firm cutoff here because it kind of depends on the organization receiving the funds, how much income you're going to need and a lot of other factors. But just in general, the smaller the gift is, the more likely you should just do a cash gift or just gift stock that we've talked about in our like concentrated stock positions video where you can just gift appreciated stock. That's a great strategy. You know, if you're one of these people that have some, some single stock position that's swelled into this big, enormous chunk of their portfolio, you might want to look at some gifting strategies like that. But uh, for larger gifts, you know, these can be very, very interesting. And they're a great way to kill multiple birds with one stone where you basically reduce the size of your estate, review, reduce future estate tax consequences, even if there's changes to the estate code, uh, state tax code, um, even, even uh, you know, getting bigger deductions this year, opening room for bigger Roth conversions this year, which could also in turn, the bigger conversions driving the adjusted gross income up can actually also increase the amount of charitable deduction you get. So there's some, some kind of cool self self feeding aspects that kind of allow the, you know, the, the bigger, the bigger conversion allows for a bigger deduction and the bigger, the gift on the deduction side, the bigger conversion you can do at a lower effective tax rate. So it's, it's kind of a, a cool thing that can work out. Uh, that's pretty interesting there. But again, I just want to really reiterate, these are not great for small gifts. So at the end of this, the way we end all of our videos, you don't need more money. You need a better plan. If you've been watching us on Facebook, you know, through Retirement Mastery, our Facebook group, you know, I, I really appreciate all you guys and, and all the survey feedback we've gotten over the last few weeks has really opened up some of these tax planning ideas that people want to learn more about, like charitable gifting and, you know, some of the other things that, that we've been getting feedback on where people want more content. Uh, also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thanks so much. Thanks for subscribing. Make sure you go check out a bunch of our videos. Um, always remember, you don't need more money. You need a better plan. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here this week. And we'll, uh, we'll see you guys next week for another great edition of Wealth Wednesday. Take care.